Uh, briefly, uh, so I, I'm Joe. I, I work on Cilium at uh, ICL and at Cisco. Uh, but today, this, I'm, I'm not speaking in that capacity. This is uh, about the eBPF Foundation. Um, so my goals today are to talk about so what, what is this uh, foundation for, for those who haven't uh, been aware of, of our activities or, or what we're doing, uh, what we're trying to do. Uh, hopefully talk a little bit about why you as, as uh, kernel contributors should, be, uh, should care about that. Uh, and I want to open a bit of dialogue about how the um, foundation can work towards goals that will, will push eBPF forward. Uh, so briefly, so the, the purpose of the eBPF Foundation is to raise uh, budget and spend funds in support of the eBPF community uh, and the technical projects as defined in the project progression policy. Um, so it's, it's really about uh, collecting uh, funds from different uh, member companies um, and then distributing those funds in ways that we think are, are going to be beneficial to, to the community uh, in, in different ways. Um, so here are the uh, foundation members. Uh, so the eBPF Foundation is a uh, fund under the Linux Foundation. Um, and so we collect dues from, from these companies and then um, distribute towards uh, efforts that, that we see as, uh, as worthwhile. Uh, a little bit about the structure. Uh, so we have a governing board, which is populated by the member, uh, member companies. Um, so they oversee the fund. They uh, make the, the decisions about how funds should be distributed. Uh, we have the, the EBPF steering committee, we call them the BSC, that's the technical board uh, that uh, provides uh, recommendations to the, to the governing board about how we should spend that money. Uh, and then there's a, a marketing committee who helps organize different, uh, di different activities, uh, events, uh, documentary, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so for this group, I, I think the, the BSC is probably the most interesting uh, group because we're the technical people trying to inform uh, the rest of the foundation. Th these are the things that we think technically will, will help uh, uh, BPF. Uh, so you probably recognize, uh, I think, just about everybody here uh, uh, in this group is, is either present or, or speaking at this conference. Um, yeah, so, so as uh, according to the charter, we have various different focus areas that the BSC is, is, is tasked with. Um, and I've brought, broken them up roughly into three uh, categories here. Um, but this is straight from the EBPF Foundation Charter. Um, so we uh, coordinate collaboration with the, the, the community. Um, so for instance, you can see obviously like LXA setting vision of like last 10 years and next 10 years of BPF, you know, those, those sorts of things. Um, and uh, proposing to the governing board about how we can coordinate and evangelize BPF project, uh, uh, projects and technologies. Um, there's a category of activities that we do around technical projects. So when we say technical projects, uh, capital T, capital P here, this is a, a project, usually a software project that lives within the eBPF Foundation. Um, so there is a process to uh, become um, a member of the eBPF Foundation. Uh, and then there's various different requirements around tra trademarks and, and various things like that. So the BSC is, is uh, responsible to oversee that. Uh, and, and the policies that, that govern how a project can become part of the eBPF Foundation and so on. Uh, now the interesting thing I think when we look at this is that eBPF is a technology. It's not necessarily a, a use case or a direct application of that technology. Uh, and so there's a lot of overlap there between what the eBPF Foundation kind of could have impact on and other foundations. So for instance, Cloud Native Computing Foundation focuses a lot on, about uh, Cloud Native and, and uh, Kubernetes uh, sort of uh, use cases. Uh, you know, there's Open Telemetry, there's Linux Foundation Networking, you know, there's various different foundations. Um, so there is a bit of a question there about what the scope is of, you know, if you are uh, running a BPF, uh, sorry, a BPF based project, um, you know, where should you go? And, and I think what we've seen for uh, quite a few projects is, is they may pick that uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation or Linux Found Foundation networking may be more tailored towards providing project-focused uh, uh, services, so whether that's like hosting your website, you know, funding your uh, CI, various things like that. Um, but we do also see that potentially there are uh, core utilities within the eBPF ecosystem that benefit everybody uh, that don't necessarily have a home elsewhere. Uh, so we're certainly open to, to discussions about where uh, you know, whether there are particular projects within the eBPF ecosystem that should live within the eBPF Foundation. Uh, and, and maybe one of the examples I'll, I'll bring up uh, so far is, is um, 
you know, Ellen Jowett talked about the BPF conformance suite. So it's clearly about BPF. It does, it's not necessarily solving a specific use case for end users, but it's, it's a bit more about how we develop this technology and so on. Uh, and then the third category that I'm uh, arbitrarily come up with here is, um, is around uh, growing the community. So proposing uh, you know, how the governing board should spend money towards events. So for instance, we're sponsoring this foundation, uh, sorry, this uh, event here at uh, Linux um, uh, LZFMM. Um, you know, we've also, uh, last year, we, we um, uh, sponsored um, someone to uh, speak at the Linux Plumbers Conference. Uh, so they otherwise wouldn't have had that opportunity to travel and, and uh, meet with the, the community and, and present that work. Um, and uh, we're also interested in you know, not, not just uh, you know, how does the Linux community work on BPF, but uh, what are other communities that are adjacent that we should be collaborating with. Um, and uh, so we're, it's, it's not just a Linux thing, it's, it's also you know, cross-platform, you know, liaising with uh, IETF. Um, or th there may be a whole bunch of other areas, you know, uh, different tool chain uh, areas. Um, so whichever ar areas that we can, as the BSC, help facilitate those conversations, make sure that we're cross-pollinating ideas and, and, and working together uh, to push BPF forward. Uh, so this next section uh, is about sort of the things we've been doing in um, 2023, uh, things we're committed to in 2024, some of the ideas about like what we'd like to do. Um, and part of this is hopefully to, to spark some ideas in, in your minds about, hey, I, I wish the eBPF Foundation could do um, such and such, and then we can kind of have a bit of discussion about that. Um, so around, like, I guess 2022, 2023, we had a lot of discussions about um, how, how, how should we standardize uh, eBPF, and, and you've had an um, update from, from Dave earlier about, you know, um, you know ultimately that, that resulted in establishing the BPF um, uh, working group within the IETF to drive that. Um, so we identified that that was a, a sensible way to do it. You know, the IETF is, is well respected and, and has good processes for, for driving consensus around a lot of that sort of thing. Um, so we're involved in uh, a whole bunch of different uh, conferences, obviously. You've, you've probably seen us around at different Linux conferences, SIGCOM, uh, eBPF Summit, um, Cloud Native Con, and so on. So last year we, we sponsored Linux Plumbers uh, and also uh, sponsored Kumar to come and um, to present his work. Uh, we've been working on a technical roadmap for BPF, so ideas about um, you know, what we should be, what areas for the community to focus um, uh, development on. Uh, and we also uh, put together a documentary around BPF, uh, which we found was very useful. E even at this conference, I was talking to some people who, you know, that gave the context for how does BPF fit into the stack. Um, and I've also heard, you know, people who are much further up the stack uh, than us, like not developers, but, uh, but maybe further up the management chain of your companies, find that quite useful to, to get a grasp on how does this technology impact um, the industry and, and why they should get involved, why they should you know, help us developers uh, work on, on BPF. Uh, as for this year, uh, so we've, we've already actually published a, a state of eBPF report. Again, that's a bit, bit more uh, higher level focused. Um, we've got a range of different conferences we will be, will be involved in. We're involved in uh, eBPF Day India. Obviously, uh, this conference, Linux Plumbers, will have an eBPF Summit later in the year. Um, and then KubeCon has uh, Cilium and eBPF Day uh, coming up. Um, so we will be sponsoring uh, Linux Plumbers, um, yeah, the Cloud, Cloud Native, uh, sorry, the Cilium and eBPF Day at uh, Cloud Native Con KubeCon. North America and kernel recipes. Um, a new effort this year is uh, where we've put together some statements of work on specific directed development activities, and I'll, I'll go into that in a bit more detail in the next slide. And maybe that that'll spark some ideas in, um, on, on um, yeah, what else we could we could focus on. Uh, we've also established a, an academic research fund, so the goal is to uh, incentivize uh, universities to uh, to research into VPF. Um, so we've got a grant that's available for uh, professors who, who direct you know, graduate, postgraduate research towards different BPF areas. Um, and if you're curious, we can also click on these links and we can, we can dig into the, the details, but all this is also available on the, um, on the website. And from the marketing com committee, we're, we're also looking at uh, driving, um, so an audit of the BPF verifier in the kernel um, and potentially putting together a threat model about, um, about BPF. That's currently just an information gathering stage. We're just figuring out how that, that will work out. Um, 
So in terms of directed development, um, so we have put out two uh, statements of work uh, already earlier this year, and we had um, a range of uh, submissions for that, for that tender offer. Um, and so we uh, got Bootlin involved. Uh, so first one was around BPF self-tests. So this is uh, taking the, the self-tests that are under the examples directory, modernizing them, moving over to the, the self-test directory um, with the, the goal to sort of eventually get rid of all of the self, that sort of testing examples that are under the examples directory that are not part of the regular CI. Uh, and then the second one that we've, we've committed to is, is improving uh, ARM64 support, given that you know, it's a very popular platform. Um, we've started writing up, well, we've wrote up a, a, an initial draft of a CFP, oh, sorry, of a, a statement of work uh, for um, improving the LVM, LVM BPF backend and, and RISC-V, uh, RISC-V uh, 64 support. Um, but I think right now we figure this is the first time we're doing it. Let's not commit to like five or six different projects and we're not really sure how the process will work yet. So we're, we're starting with a couple of these um, and getting a feel for the process. You know, we need to work with the Linux Foundation to tender the contracts, make sure that they're delivered and, and all that kind of stuff and, and the oversight. So, um, but I think there's, I think we're quite interested in how we can direct some of that um, funding from the eBPF Foundation towards um, you know, open uh, development on core infrastructure that benefits everybody. Um, and so, yeah. Um, and then I guess, yeah. So we haven't written something up for Cisco or BPF BTF uh, coverage, but I guess that's another idea. Um, from here, I'm, I want to just kind of open up the floor and say, how could we? Uh, you know, how could the EBPF Foundation help the, the community? Um, and yeah, I'm also happy to click on some of these links if you're curious to get into the details of what are the proposals. And, um, yeah. um, something that I didn't see you mention that the BSC discussed last year, just wonder if it's still uh, within the realm of possibility or whatever, is having the eBPF Foundation in particular publish a white paper on uh, BPF security. Yes, um, actually. Because got, it's a frequent last question and analysts and stuff keep claiming that BPF is insecure and so on. And having something that's not from a company but from the BPF Foundation that's uh, kind of industry consensus across companies, that would be more powerful, so. Yeah, KP and I will do it. We've got an outline. And if KP, if, we, if we're both in the same place at the same time, we'll get it done. Okay, great. I, I only called it out because it wasn't on the slides, so. Yeah, I, I, I meant to add it. I, I think. Okay, I, cool. It, it, I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> That's, yeah. I, I think in a similar note, the threat model comes up a lot in conversations. People just have a checkbox that anything that's running needs to have a threat assessment. If the BPF Foundation had a link you could point to, and people could just grab it, and it didn't look like, <laughs> like I'm sort of self-certifying my own thing, right? It would be a, a it would be a sort of a win, for sure. Mm -hmm. So just uh, I saw it was on the list, so plus one, I guess, from from my uh, yeah. yeah the threat model there, yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's uh, there's obviously been a lot of interest in, in security in BPF for the last several years, um, and there can be perhaps even some. Some misguided uh, views on even like or outdated views of, of saying, for instance, um, uh, you know, I, I think initially when we introduced the um, like rootless uh, EBPF, and I, I, like a lot of uh, security reports came up on that. So I, I think it might be useful to, I guess, update and say like this is this is what the latest is, and this is what the current state of unprivileged and and. How we're, how we're seeing the security model around that. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think the, the threat assessment documents have some sort of format that people are used to seeing, so if, if it helps, we could find somebody who's used to being third-party threat assessment kind of stuff. This is just like a, I have a set of compliance, I need to have a threat assessment of all the software in my box. It, it, it's, you know, sort of outside the realm of, like, this room's engineering work, but, like, mm -hmm. Um, we could use it a lot. The other one I think that is interesting for a lot of people is like how to, it falls closely into the threat assessment would be like the trusted boot chain. Like how does that entire trusted boot chain work? How do they integrate? Um, 
some multiple people have asked me for some sort of guidance on this. It's like they know how to do trusted boot, they run in these trusted boot environments, they have a compliance regulation that says they have to be in a trusted boot environment. And then BPF, the question is always like, does BPF meet the requirement or not meet the requirement? And what's the document that says I can use this with these compliance requirements? You know, so like these sorts of things are, are stuff we're starting to run into, at least with Tetragon, um, pretty frequently now. So, so I guess maybe, um, so there's various different, so there's obviously there's the category of like conference sponsorship, so allowing us to kind of gather together or like assisting in the gathering together of people to, to drive BPF forward. Um, there's sort of the direct development kind of aspect. And, the, and then I guess there's another category which is maybe a bit more like um, different documents that we use for educating and, and, and whether that's um, up at higher level of, of like, here's how eBPF fits into technology or with AI or you know, whatever it is at that level, or there's maybe a little bit more target is, is, is what you're kind of saying around um, you know, technical details, like how do you, uh, how, how does BPF satisfy certain constraints within like a, a security context or, or so on. Um, I think the maybe interesting thing there is, is like, to what degree is uh, the eBPF Foundation a, a useful space to host these documents? And then we develop those documents within, you know, whether it's just us on the mailing list or, uh, you know, however else we do it versus saying like, okay, we'll, we'll run specific meetings, you know, based on the, you know, within the EBPF foundation based on this. Having a third party that's not me self-certifying my own thing has a lot of, a lot of value. Like no one, no one believes me when I say my stuff is good, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they want to see like a third party, a third party audit and a, like right. a, here's a threat assessment. And, so, so, so when you say certify, I guess there's kind of a there's, a, there's a range of possibilities there, like whether it's, you know, uh, no, I'm completely throwing things out here because yeah. it's a brand new idea to me. But, um, you know, eBPF as the thing that, so you go to the eBPF and you say, hey, eBPF Foundation, can you please certify my product? Or there would be a different model, which is like eBPF Foundation says, here are the constraints. And then there are like third parties that say like, oh, I, I will tell you like, Yes, you follow these constraints or not. Like, I, I, the most pressing need for me is just a threat assessment document. I, I can show yeah. you what they look like. They follow a certain mm -hmm. pattern. They all look more okay. or less okay. the same. They. Um, so so that, that's just, here's how BPF fits into this we, you know, we tr If it's a root user, these are the threat models that we protect against and stuff, it, it, stuff right. like that. Like, so uh, if I understand what you're arguing for, John, I'm not sure. So it so sounds like you're saying the, I, the EBPF Foundation could contract a third party that's an expert in writing threat assessments, yeah. pay them by the foundation budget, take the threat assessment, and then publish it on the EBPF Foundation website for everybody to look at. Yeah, I think Is that, that what would you're be, saying? That's, that's basically it. And then when everybody asks me, hey, what's the threat assessment of BPF, I could say, like, read the document. There it is. Yeah, and so then the request is... If done that way, it doesn't mean that the EB5 Foundation or the BSC has to go and write that document. You're saying, right. find somebody that's an expert in doing that, yeah. pay them to do this, out of, have the foundation pay for that, and then publish it. Exactly, because okay. the, the security experts in this space, like, they're not really our space of engineering, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they're a different type of engineer or technical person. And those documents, there's like an expectation, like a chief and security person expects them to be in some sort of layout, right? And, and that's, that's all. Yeah, so that, that sounds like absolutely with, like within the scope of what the BSC could oversee, certainly. Um, so yeah, that's, that's good feedback. Um, maybe not, not to pick on you, but I, I know David, uh, like uh, uh, we'd had a, a little bit of a chat about maybe, you know, so one of the statement of work ideas was improving LVM. So well, what we want is tool chains to be, to be better. So would, would there be opportunities for, um, you know, improving GCC or like that side of the tool chain, right? But I don't know if you have any thoughts about, say, low hanging fruit or like whether it be, you know, we can collect together a list that, that the foundation could potentially help with, with developing that or do you see it kind of a. I mean, I guess in that regard, like, for, for the LLVM BPF backend, I mean, is there some set of set of things that have been identified already that are like, these are what we need people to work on, but we don't have anybody working on them, and then the foundation will pay for that? Or? The answer is yes, and I'll see if I can. Uh... I guess my, my question, 
what I'm trying to say is, is that, is it, um, there is already a pre-existing set of things that need to be improved in the, BPF, in the LLVM BPF backend that someone else has decided, or are you looking for people to come along and say, oh, okay. I have this idea of how I can improve it, please pay me, because those are, those are different things. So the, the way I think we've, we've come up with this was, uh, you know, BSC members looking at what's going on in, the, in the, uh, this community and saying, okay, the, this is our kind of wish list or the things that we think need to be improved in, in LLVM, and we've kind of assembled a set of things that we think are, are, are interesting to, to improve. So I guess that would be the natural model to maybe, maybe follow, but... Uh, yeah, I think this project is something nice to have, but not really urgent. So we just propose a few of them. So if anybody interested, then they can contribute. But if you are really serious about supporting more than one compiler, I would really suggest you that uh, projects like this, like code coverage support for BPF programs. So yeah, it would need some compiler support, but it doesn't have to yeah. be yes. specific all, all to LLVM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a if, compiler yeah. project like more general so if you could find a contractor that will act will actually do the design and the implementation in both compilers that would be <laughs> awesome so yeah i mean like this one for instance we like i don't think we've like it's, we've just written a, written a document like i think it's just in draft right so we could potentially look at reworking that to, to be more like agnostic should we say I, I don't know what that looks like in terms of the, the contractors that are out there but i guess that's part of the that's the implementation details right like if we're, if we're Yeah, makes sense. I mean, I think this one, before we actually get this to some contractor, we will break it down and then also uh, if we find contractors which could do both, yeah, that's a great idea. And I, and, and I think that's also the point, right? I mean, that's why we're, Joe is presenting, like if, we, if, you have, if you see other projects that would be super useful, but currently nobody has cycles on it, but it could be done by some contractor, yeah, please, please let us know, right? I mean, that's what the foundation is therefore to spend money to improve the infrastructure so another one i thought of from this week that i didn't see up there was like there was a talk and we had like some isa compliance things with the testing on the verifier and stuff like all that would fit i think pretty nicely into this right because you're creating the ISA the standard you could probably have a contractor then create the test case for those or, or whatever that looks like. I think there were some good ideas on, on mm -hmm. you know, kind of what that might look like. So, so you're talking about like the BPF conformance uh, suite? Yeah, yeah, there was, yeah. we had a, you know, so, the talk and they were talking about, you know, whether yeah. it, maybe we have a machine readable format or maybe we have some way to mm -hmm. translate the ISA into tests or compare Clang and, and mm -hmm. GCC. Like all of that looks like good yeah. third, like nice that a vendor is not necessarily doing it and, and nice that, you know, the same body that's doing the standard also publishes the set of com you know compliance mm -hmm. tests. Just a just a thought. Resolution is somehow off. I can't quite tell what's going on in there. <laughs> is there? No. Is there another point? No. No. Okay. Cool. Any any other comments, feedbacks? All right. So uh, I will maybe. Sorry. Ah. I'll just say on Mike what I said to John. So I think that's a good idea. I think in particular, I think the thing that John's talking about is I think Alan's last bullet, right, where he said, if you had a formal model of the ISA, then could you programmatically derive tests? And I'm saying, having somebody actually try to do that, I think, would be a, a good thing to put a statement of work and be very useful. So. so I just want to flash this up again. Like the BSC at list.ebpf foundation, this is an open list with the BSC. Um, so if you have ideas, you wake up in, the, in the, the middle of the night and you're like, oh, I wish the EBPF foundation did this, then uh, feel free to send that email there and then we can, we can kind of take it from there. So I think in the EBPF Foundation website, it mentioned that uh, it suggests uh, subscribing to main at list.ebpf.foundation. That's one of uh, that's the that's one of the suggestion for involvement. And uh, what the, what exactly does uh, main at what exactly does does that list do?
Anybody in the room know? I'm actually not familiar specifically with Maine. If nobody on the BSC knows, um, I think it's announcements from the <coughs> from the BPF as a foundation as a whole, not from the BSC. And okay. so, if you want to get on the announcements of, of things that the foundation does, then I think that's what it was what it was intended for. I mean, you can ask Sridhar to see what is actually being sent to that, if anything, because there should be an archive right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you join the list, I think you can see the archive. Um, but my guess is just announcements about. Yeah, so I don't know. There's yeah, much I mean, there. So. I guess, like, yeah. For instance, there's different activities that we put out the EBPF documentary. Uh, the, st the state of uh, EBPF report. Um, there was a year in review. We did the BSC um, review of, of, of what we did in 2023. So I'm guessing it's probably those sorts of announcements that they're also present on the on the website. All right. Six. Yeah. Um, yeah. Otherwise, uh, yeah. thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> so that's it for this year's conference. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>